the 9th of March 2017. A very good evening to you and welcome to this edition. It's the 9th of March 2017. A very good evening to you and welcome to this edition of Vantage Point. And of course, with me, I have the eminent Dr. Diane Jayatilaka to keep us abreast of this week's latest happenings in the political sphere in Sri Lanka. A very good evening to you, Doctor, and welcome to the show. Good evening, Krishan. Good to be here. Indeed. Now, as we all know, time flies. Now, it's already the third month of 2017 and another session of the UN Human Rights Council is already upon us. Now, as we know, the 34th session of the UNHRC is currently underway in Geneva. And there are talks that the resolution which was co-sponsored or which is co-sponsored by Sri Lanka will get extended. Why is this, Doctor? And what implications will this have on Sri Lanka? Well, we got ourselves into a, a situation we shouldn't have in 2015 by co-sponsoring a resolution which contained things that would be very difficult to implement on the ground in Sri Lanka. Now, the minister who, uh, who signed up to that should have known that it wasn't going to be easy. So, he's in a jam now and uh, the government is negotiating uh, for an extension. Uh, the newspaper said it will be two years. There's a problem there too, because it doesn't remove what we committed ourselves to, that is the setting up of special courts, a special council, and new laws, preferably from their point of view with foreign judges, judges. Uh, to try allegations of war crimes. Now, the two-year extension won't take that away. It postpones, postpones it. the whole process. And as a result of the postponement, you may have, according to news reports, conditionalities and a timetable. So in a way, it's like debt. You, 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 you owe money. You ask for uh, a delay in your repayment. And they're going to tighten the conditions of repayment. You speak of conditions, Doctor. Uh, well, there were a number of conditions or requests that were put out by the UNHRC. How successful has Sri Lanka been in fulfilling these requests? I mean, there was an Office of Missing Persons Act that was established, but as we all know, there is no physical office present anywhere. What is going on? Well, political realities. No government in its right senses should have committed itself to things that cannot obtain a consensus. Uh, so, the OMP has uh, been watered through the Office of Missing Persons, but it's not been easy to set it up. Why is that? Because there's something wrong in the design. Now, the Office of Missing Persons bill as it was originally drafted by the Attorney General's Department, was a decent bill. And it said that no information that is produced here will be used subsequently at a trial. So, you know, you can be free to tell the truth, uh, provide information, and that won't, there won't be a spillover. Now, according to Professor Stephen Ratner, a member of the old Darusman panel, the government removed that firewall. And now what you have is a far more controversial situation, where the OMP, the, the data or the material, the information that is collected by the OMP can be used for trials in Sri Lanka or elsewhere. So it becomes more contentious. Therefore, it's not that easy to actually set it up. There's some kind of institutional resistance. Do you think that's a satisfactory answer the government can give 
the families of people who went missing from the war, people who are waiting to know what happened to their loved ones, their fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, sons, daughters? Well, yes and no. It all depends on the approach you've taken. Now, there's been quite a lot of that in Northern Ireland. And the war there started in 1969, ended with the Good Friday Agreement. But there was no accountability mechanism because the IRA, rep represented by the Sheep and Fane, and the British government decided that if they went down that road, uh, too many wounds would be reopened. So you may ask, what about the victims of the families? In Northern Ireland, they found other ways of reconciliation rather than reopening those wounds. Now, in Sri Lanka, this government decided to go the whole hog and promised the OMP, promised the Truth Commission, promised special courts. It promised a four-tier structure. Every tier contradicted each other. Now, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is from South Africa. The South African TRC is precisely uh, an alternative to courts. But here you have a promise to implement the TRC and the promise of special courts. So, once you've made promises, then it's very difficult to renege on them. So the government has got itself into a trap of its own making. And it's under fire from the president who says, hey, no foreign judges on my watch. And from uh, those in the Human Rights Council who say, hey, you signed up to this in 2015. Where did we go wrong? And if you have to point a finger at someone, who does it get pointed at? Well, I'd have to go on the basis of the facts. And the facts are uh, disclosed by uh, the Honorable Prime Minister himself. Uh, the uh, 2015 resolution, the American resolution, was being negotiated by the Sri Lankan team in Geneva. That included two ambassadors, the present ambassador, uh, as well as our ambassador to Vienna, who was brought in to assist in the negotiations. And our team was whittling it down, was making it more acceptable to the Sri Lankan public. When the Honorable Prime Minister says that he intervened, um, and he, uh, at a dinner, he pointed to the British High Commissioner, James Doris, and said that the British High Commissioner reached out to him and said, what's happening? Uh, your delegation is... Uh, trying to dilute this agreement. And then the Prime Minister said he gave orders to our delegation in Geneva, stop your negotiations, we'll take it from here. And the PM gave instructions to sign up to the resolution. So if I have to blame somebody, much as I would like to blame Foreign Minister Samarvira, uh, I would have to say that it goes higher up. It was the Prime Minister who took the decision not to water down the 2015 resolution, to keep it as it was, and to co-sponsor it. So now we are committed. So from Doctor, what you just said, you say we are in a soup, the country is in a soup. How can we come out of this? How can we untangle the knots that we tied ourselves? Well, it's, it's possible. Because two things have happened in the world which we can actually leverage to our benefit. One is the victory of Donald Trump uh, and the eviction of all those State Department people and White House people who were gunning for Sri Lanka. I mean, he didn't throw them out because they were gunning for Sri Lanka. He threw them out because they didn't share his views. So you have people with a fresh uh, mindset in Washington. A clean slate. Then you have Prime Minister Theresa May, who has not said anything about Sri Lanka, but has said about her own army, the British army, that she's not going to allow Geneva to sit in judgment of British soldiers. 
So we have two leaders with whom we can talk to if we want to talk to them. Now the problem is that last week when our foreign minister addressed the UN Human Rights Council's high level segment, he went out of his way to make a criticism of President Donald Trump. I mean, he didn't have to. He talked about populism. Now, he's not the president of Sri Lanka. He's not the prime minister of Sri Lanka. There is no stance or decision in the government of Sri Lanka that populism is a bad thing. In fact, the Sri Lankan president resorts to populism on and off. Now, who told Mangala Samarvira that populism was a bad thing in the world? Especially when it gives Sri Lanka an opportunity of getting this Geneva resolution off our backs, which where we put it, you know, ourselves. But now there's been a change. We wanted to cozy up to the Brits and the Americans, okay, but there's been a change there. We can use that change to get out of this. But when you criticize the very change that might enable you to get out of this situation, then that means you want to remain in this situation. situation. Well, what do you think, how, how successful do you think Sri Lanka is in handling or the government of Sri Lanka has been in handling itself in the international community? We'll have a look at that after this short commercial break. Welcome back. You're watching Vantage Point with me, Krishan Devasagayam. Now, as we know, the 34th sessions of the UN at Human Rights Council is upon us and the resolution co-sponsored by Sri Lanka is once again the topic of discussion. Dr. Dayan Jayatilaka, how do you think the government of Sri Lanka has been? How successful do you think it has been when it comes to handling its affairs with the international community. As we know, the previous regime did distance itself from the Western community, while the current incumbent administration has taken quite an opposite view. Do you think it's been successful? No, I don't. And, and I'll tell you why. Um, I've been around uh, international conferences from the time I was quite young. Um, thanks to my parents, I was on the sidelines of the second non-aligned conference in Cairo in 1964. So I've been watching this um, game, the international game, for a very long time. And I cannot remember ever having heard a foreign minister of any country telling the international community at a serious gathering something as negative about his country as Foreign Minister Mangala Samarvira said in Geneva this time. Never. Not by a Sri Lankan Foreign Minister, not by any Foreign Minister. Um, minister Samarvira speaking at the high level segment, which was uh, attended also by UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, said the following in a written speech. He said, for 69 years, Sri Lanka's efforts and nation building and socio-economic progress have been a failed experiment. We must put an end to this era. Now I'm quoting, I'm not paraphrasing. Now this is a foreign minister who says that on the two most important things a state can do, nation building and socio-economic progress, we have failed for 69 years. He is pretty much saying we have failed state. And he says you must put an end to this era. Now he's not the head of state. And no head of state even says that in an international gathering about his country. Governments come, governments go. But you don't write off your post independence history as a failed experiment. So when you start off saying that to the international community, you are really throwing overboard any self-respect as a country. But who could have authorized such a speech being delivered? I'm sure someone in the hierarchy would have been aware I of it. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think that uh, there is an elected president. I mean, there's a, there's a leader. The country has a leader. And there are at least three people who think that they are leaders, apart from the one who is the leader. 
the prime minister thinks he's the leader of the country, the foreign minister thinks he's the leader of the country, and the former president thinks that she's the leader of the country. So they make statements which only a leader of a country, an elected leader can make, and the elected leader quite rightly has not made any such statement, and will not, nobody does. Nobody says, you know, for 70 years or 69 years, we have been a failed experiment in the two most important things that we have tried to do and that this era must be ended. So, will action be taken against the foreign minister for making such a statement? I certainly hope so, but I rather doubt it. And he went on, he went on to say that as a result of uh, ending this era, which he wants to do very fast, that by our 70th Independence Day next year, we shall have a third Republican constitution. And he, he further said that a referendum is an imperative. Now, this is not approved by the cabinet. This is not the view of the president. This is not the view of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party, which is an important component of the coalition government. And this is not something that a foreign minister should say at a high level segment of a United Nations gathering. I mean, this, uh, this is completely, you know, it's out of control. So, that is why I say, never in my conscious lifetime have I seen a foreign minister behaving so badly in an international, in the international arena as this foreign minister. Uh, doctor, coming back to the topic of the, the content of the Geneva sessions, now I have a copy of uh, a report released by the UN Human Rights Office, which said that progress in terms of reconciliation and justice in Sri Lanka is slow. How do you measure progress? And do you think it is fair for the international community or the UN Human Rights Office to impose a so-called speed limit on the activities carried out by our country? After all, we came out after a 30 year long war and it's only been a couple of years since then. Do you think it's fair for them to say it's slow? Well, it's not fair, but we gave them the opening to say that. It's not fair because after 30 years of war, reconciliation is something that must grow organically. It cannot be imposed from above according to a resolution. But we open the door, Krishan. Why do I say that? Check that report. That's uh, Zaid al Hussein's uh, report, the High Commissioner's report, which is to be tabled on the 22nd of March. Quite a bit of it quotes the report, approvingly quotes the report, of the Consultative Committee on Reconciliation appointed by the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka. Now, this is the so-called Manori Muturegama report. I mean, it's it's really Dr. Parkes Soti Saran Muthu's report because he's the General Secretary of, the, of that uh, committee, the Consultative Committee. Now, the Consultative Committee on Reconciliation, mind you, has recommended that there be special courts, echoing Zaid al Huzain, special courts, special counsel, and that there should be a foreign judge for each special court. And it has gone further and said that uh, for anything that smacks of war crimes, there should be no amnesty at all. Now, this is a report of a committee appointed by the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka. Entirely consisting of NGO people, not a single person who served his or her country, uh, never served the state, unlike the LLRC uh, commissioners. What does this report do? The report just approvingly quotes this and urges that we implement it. It's our, I mean, it's appointed by the Prime Minister. So, well, we open the door for this. The sessions are yet going on. So, yeah. we'll, most probably when we meet again, we will talk on it to see whether actually there was a negative implication on it or not. Doctor, I have one more topic for you on sure. the land issue that exists in the north, but we'll speak on that right after this short break. Welcome back to the show. And doctor, one final question. The land issue in the north. Now, 
The Tamil people living in most of the war ravaged areas are yet to receive the land that they owned back before the conflict started, mostly because they are being used by the military. Why do you think this is yet happening? The war finished back in 2009. We, we are now in 2017. It's almost eight years. Don't you think it's time up for a permanent solution to this problem? Well, it is. Uh, one problem was demining. So it took a long time to demine extensively mined areas. And the other problem is to do with strategically vital pieces of land. Now, the TNA wants all land released, including the land that the tigers use to build airstrips. Now, the fact that they use them to build airstrips means that these are strategically pivotal areas. Once you fought a war and you won, you don't necessarily go back to the situation that existed before the war started. That is why after World War II, US bases are still all over the world. They didn't go back to where uh, before the war started. Uh, I'm not saying that the military should stay in all the places that they've been staying. But you can't turn the clock back because the military has also seen which areas are vulnerable, what the gaps are, and there are strategic and security concerns in terms of holding on to some parts, some lands and some, uh, some areas. And that is so universal. This also happens to be uh, an area where you had a 30 year conflict and it's a border area. It's the area which is separated from a hostile Tamil Nadu by only 18 miles of sea. So there are strategic concerns, but um, I think there's been progress in, in returning lands. What I think should be done is that the land provisions of the 13th Amendment should be implemented without alteration. Now, there are those who want the land provisions scrapped and all land to be held by the central Steve. government. There are others who do not like the fact that state land in the North and East and in fact everywhere is vested in by definition the state, the central government, whereas the rest of the land is with the provincial council. Now the TNA wants to abolish that and it wants all land to be vested in the provincial council and any use of land for developmental purposes to be only with the permission of the chief minister. Now, that's absurd because the north and east uh, are actually two-thirds of the landmass of the island. Uh, and where there's demographic pressure, population pressure, you need the state to have some ability to have development projects everywhere in the country. So the smartest thing would be to actually streamline the implementation of the existing 13th Amendment provisions on land. Because if you open it up this way or the other way, uh, you're opening up uh, two different cans of worms. Uh, so I, I do think, of course, the, the representatives of the area should have the power over the use of land in their province, except for what used to be called crown land, but is now state land, and the land for inter-provincial irrigation works. Uh, irrigation works that cut across more than one province. Point. That is the provision of the 13th Amendment, which I remember very well since I was a minister in the first Northeastern Provincial Council, the youngest provincial minister. So I think that's, uh, that should stand and be implemented. Well, on that thought, we wrap up another edition of Vantage Point. It was a pleasure having you with us. Join us again in two weeks when we'll be back here, same time, same place. Until then, take care. Good night. Good night.